Hi, everybody. It's Mike. I wanted to do a quick follow-up with you on the episode I did last time with Ed Lewick. We were talking about Summer Side of Life, and he wanted to add that Millie Kirkham was the singer who provided the high female harmony on that song. K-I-R-K-H-A-M is the last name. She was very well known in Nashville and did a whole lot of work with Elvis and many other artists. Ed also wanted to recommend a book called Hit Men, Power Brokers and Fast Money Inside the Music Business by Frederick Dannon, and you can find that on Amazon. So I hope that you enjoyed the episode he and I did together. I know I enjoyed doing it with him. And now on with today's episode. The first guest of the evening is truly a poet. He's an artist. He is a, a friend and an inspiration to anyone who I think who has ever played the guitar uh, or tried to write poetry. Would you please welcome Gordon Lightfoot? It was only yesterday when I heard the teacher say patiently, one and two make three. We were children, you and me. Let us pray for the ones they call the children of today. This is Carefree Highway Revisited, the show that celebrates the work of Gordon Lightfoot song by song, a proud member of the That's Not Canon podcast network. I'm your host, Mike Messner, and along with me today are two fellow Lightfoot fans from Bettendorf, Iowa, making their third appearance on the show, Kevin and Aaron Hester. Kevin and Aaron, welcome back. It's great to see you again. Thank you. You too. It's it's nice to be here again. So today we're talking about Too Late for Praying, and this came from, of course, the Sundown album in 1974. Why in particular did you want to talk about this one? There's all sorts of great songs on Sundown, but why this one today? To me, it's the best song on the album, so deep. I mean, Sundown is a great bar song. You can hear any band do it, but there's such a rich spiritual meaning in Too Late for Pray. It gets to me every time I hear it. I just feel that it kind of pertains to the times now compared to before, even though Before, it was better than now because it's gotten worse. It just reflects everything that's going on. In that sense, yeah, I think you're right, Aaron. It's timeless, isn't it? Because some things seem to be getting better, and yet we also realize that there is so much that is changing, and it's not necessarily for the good. And in that sense, it really is a timeless song. And to me, it's also a perfectly balanced reaction to the world's issues and problems from somebody who maybe is realizing that religious belief or religious practices by themselves are not enough, that God has a role to play, of course, but we have one also, and that we have a plan in this, and God's not going to do it for us, and he's also not going to ask us to do his part of it. Do you have a special anecdote about what the song means to you or how it's affected your lives? Well, like I said, every time I hear it, I get a tear in my eye. It just hits my heart. And you just keep thinking, such wise words. Let's put them into action. Like, for example, I'm sure being a history buff, which I know you are, you remember the story about with all the bombing in Europe, uh, how the church were affected. The one church statue of Jesus had his hands blown off. And they said, okay, let's rebuild it with the hands. And somebody else said, no. We need to be the hands of God on earth. It's great symbolism, that mm-hmm. that story. And it really does say that, yes, we need to rebuild the statue, but more importantly, we need to be the eyes, the hands, the feet of Christ. If you're coming from the Christian perspective, of course, what is the best time of day or the best scene for you to be listening to this? Could you listen to this at any time, or is this one where you'd need to be in a certain place or doing a certain thing? I think it's something that we need to concentrate on any time of the day, really. It doesn't matter. You need to focus more on what it says and how to put it in action, like Kevin said. It's just an any time of the day thing. You don't need to to pick a certain time of the day. I think it's an all the time thing. To me, it's more than just background music. Yeah. It's something you need to be able to sit down and reflect upon. 
I like the way you said that because it really has a very direct message to it. This is not ambient yeah. music. Some of Gordon's other songs you could have kind of playing in the background and they're just a good accompaniment. Yeah. But this is sit down. I'm going to tell you where the cabbage is chewed. And he does that without coming off as being preachy. And I think that's the right. thing that I like about it. I can see myself listening to this song. We're recording early afternoon on the West Coast as we're sitting here. Mm -hmm. And I can see myself listening to this song about five hours from now when the sun is mm -hmm. going down and I'm contemplating what are the responsibilities that I have to fulfill tomorrow and how can I make tomorrow better than today? And it's doubly true for me because I've had the last week off. And so tomorrow I have to go yeah. back to work after 10 days of, of vacation. So it's very apt for me as we're sitting here today. Well, I couldn't find out anything about the writing of the song. It's only mentioned once in the Jennings biography. Yeah. And I scoured other sources to see if Lightfoot had ever gone on record about how the song got written. I couldn't find anything. But Kevin, you're the great Lightfoot detective. Did you ever find oh, anything you. about how the song got written? No, I haven't. But I have found out on the... Lightfoot Companion, they had a very interesting thing about album notes from Sundown that Aaron would read. Okay. Well, it we found this information. Uh, Too Late for Praying is one song that may indeed be more powerful without the string section. Hearing it as it was recorded live on the studio floor was just guitars and basses awesome. Huh. I hadn't thought about it when you strip it down and mm -hmm. many songs are better when you do strip them down particularly with acoustic music there's no place to mm -hmm. hide in the first place we'll talk more about the musicianship but thank you for mm -hmm. you know, looking that up it's bit, so it's mm -hmm. more about the studio experience rather than the actual composition of it right mm -hmm. right we'll never know at this point what was going through lightfoot's head unfortunately right but as you know may have turned away like so many people have, but he grew up in the church, singing in the choir. The first song he ever did was The Lord's Prayer, which was recorded when he was like fifth grade or something like that. So, I mean, there was always a spiritual foundation there. Yeah, he'd certainly been exposed to the church. I think he'd been taught a certain amount of reverence in different yes. contexts. He, as many people did, it didn't take for a long time if it ever took again at all, but he certainly had a consciousness of it. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Let's take a look at the lyrics, or at least some of them. It was only yesterday when I heard the teachers say patiently, one and two make three. We were children, you and me. Let us pray for the ones they call the children of today. Nothing left but promises. Nothing much is certain. So there's this great change in perception he was talking about what life was like as a child. Things right. were pretty uncomplicated. There was always mommy and daddy standing by to quote Jerome Kern. Mm -hmm. And now he's looking at the present generation. Looking back at this, this is now not quite 50 years later. I think we exactly. see that the generations of it, every generation has a life that is significantly more complicated than the previous generation. And mm -hmm. so before he passed, I think Gordon was very aware of the kind of things that are facing the kids today who are being taught one and two make three. Right. All we see is want and need across the board. Why, thank you, Lord, we're living in the glory of your care. Skies of blue have all turned brown to the sound of sighing. When I first heard this, I thought this is a little sarcastic that God is in control, and yet look at what has happened to the skies. And I got to think that this is an allusion to industrial waste, to pollution. There's smog everywhere, which people put there. God certainly did not decide, I think I'm going to make life more difficult for my children. So I'm wondering, did you two get the sense of sarcasm there at all? Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. And remember, when this was read in 72, 73, recorded in the fall of 73, we had come off the first Earth Day a couple of years ago, and Gordon was very involved in all the environmental causes. Yes. So when you see that, and God's perfect world, 
what didn't have any of this. But what has happened is man has changed the world and not for the better. Right. Yeah, you brought up the idea of man changing the world. We'll talk about that yeah. in a second or two. Yeah. This is certainly an unwanted consequence. And yeah. when we think now, again, all these years later, at what we have made of the globe, mm-hmm. not just industry. I don't want to be yeah. absolutely painting yeah. too broad a brush there, but right. certainly we've contributed to what the world has become environmentally. And so I think the sarcasm and then also the realization, okay, look, you know, yeah. this is what we did. It's not shaking his fist at God, but it is right. the kind no. of irony of right. Mm-hmm. right. We'll be right back to our conversation with Kevin and Aaron Hester about Too Late for Praying. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. Radio is so much different than it was in the 80s. We had it all. The music, the movies, the DJs, and morning shows. Back to the 80s Radio is a show from the 80s in podcast form. We bring the memories from that awesome decade back. Join Toscano and Chang every Friday as they take you on a ride back in time, sharing their experiences and laughs. Stop on by and discover some of the wacky things this crazy duo comes up with. They talk about it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the greatest decade. Don't miss the greatest 80s podcast in the world. Back to the 80s radio is that song really a cover what instrument are they playing there what do those crazy lyrics mean if you're the kind of person who thinks about stuff like that you're in luck because i've got just the podcast for you how good it is chooses a single song each episode and takes a dive into the story behind the song and the artist who made it famous i'm claude call you can find me in your favorite podcast software or just point your browser to howgooditis.com. How good it is. Lord abide, let us stem the tide of broken dreams. Sometimes you seem to tell us it's too late for praying. Now, when you first hear that, maybe you think to yourself, isn't prayer always a good idea? And if you yeah. come from a certain spiritual background, as you do and as I do, we yeah. believe that prayer is always a good thing. It's always a good idea. Yeah. But it sounds like what Gordon is saying here is God has done everything he can, you know, that it right. is now up to us to do our part of this partnership that we're supposed to have with God, praying and saying, God, do our part for us, do our part for us, do our part right. for us is not going to do any yeah. good. So in that sense, right. it is too late. Wondering if you two have any thoughts on that. Yeah, as one of the notes we wrote, it seems like as people, we mess things up so bad, then we go to God and ask for prayer, ask for guidance, where actually we should ask for God's guidance and direction before we do things. And we put things in wrong order. Sometimes, yeah, we do. Yeah, I got to think that the people just coming back to the whole idea of the skies have all turned brown, Okay, that they probably... Even if they purported to be believers, they probably didn't say, Lord, should we build this factory? I think right. they were yeah. probably thinking, well, of course we're going to build this factory because right. it means money. And mm-hmm. it's not to say that having the desire to succeed is bad. It just means that they did mm-hmm. not prioritize what the God they purported to believe in might have to say right. about that. Right. And right. Right. I totally agree with that. Yes. Uh-huh. See the ocean wild and blue. Mm -hmm. Think of all that's in her. She will not surrender to the likes of us, but then she must. And I think this is kind of an allusion to the idea that as we're told in Genesis, man is supposed to have Mm -hmm. dominion over the earth, but the ocean is still something that was almost entirely untamed. And these days is still almost entirely untamed. Now, Mm -hmm. Kevin and Aaron, you're a fair distance away from the surf, but if you've ever been sailing or if you've ever been out in the ocean, you know that the ocean is remarkably unforgiving. It won't let you make more than two mistakes in a row. Right. And usually just one. And it's never heard of you. So it's not surrendering to us. It's unpredictable. (laughs) Well, it's just like anything is unpredictable. It could be a a human being. Autistic child has unpredictable ways. 
it just depends. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen yeah. until it happens. And with the ocean, I mean, it's so, the ocean, yeah. so vast and you may be just totally comfortable in, you know, right. out to 10 feet on the ocean. You may be, hey, th there's no problem here, but you get out in different areas of the ocean, storms come up quickly and they can be devastating. Yeah. Yeah, and people have been trying for years to say, well, we need to have mm -hmm. conquest over the ocean. And I'm thinking to myself, well, right. good luck on that, buddy, because yeah, right. <laughs> it's simply not going to happen. And there are some parts of nature that mankind is never going to have full dominion on. Yeah, like it says, wise men tell us. They tell us, but they don't tell God. They don't tell the ocean. Right. Oh, yeah. You don't have control over it. <laughs> yeah, because we don't have control. No. Lord abide, let us stem the tide of helplessness. But then I guess we're yeah. living. Is it too late for trying? This is kind of a desperate. I mean, I can hear some despair yeah. in this. Are mm -hmm. we even going to bother anymore right. to, to stop the misery of children who are crying right. for a number of reasons? Right. Or to try to save the oceans from being polluted, which we have right. the power to do? Or have we just given up? And whether that's a giving up of, it's too big a problem. I'm not even going to try, or I never yeah. even noticed that it was a problem because I'm still counting my money, tending right. my own garden, whatever metaphor you want to have. Mm -hmm. Right. I see that too, where people just want to give up because it's just not working. Yes. I can see almost that it's a too late for trying, almost being a plea. Yeah. I mean, what should we do? Should we go on or not go on? Is it me alone, or do I need? need to get others involved in their strength in numbers, as you know. I can tell you from my own personal life, I have a real mm -hmm. burden for the nation of Haiti. I've been there yeah. Um, yeah. and I've seen the kind of problems that the people there have had. And yeah. most of them mm -hmm. were not of their own making. And you right. think there is just so much that no matter what well-intended people seem to do, it does not seem mm. to be getting any better. Mm -hmm. And yeah. at times I'm thinking to myself, yeah, gosh, is there even any point in supporting this mission effort or giving money to this yeah. hospital or going along to work in this orphanage? I mean, at some point, is it even right. worth trying? And that's an example in really in our own backyard in the United oh, States. Yeah. Right. Yes. Like oh. they say, it gets worse before it gets better. <laughs> Well, I'd like to think it will get better. Well, you have to. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes the problems seem to be so big and so massive. But then if you look at it, improving one life at a time, we can do that. Right. We cannot take care of a whole city, but we can take care of our neighbor. Yeah. And bringing it back to the religious illusions that he's made, yeah. Christ never went further than 50 miles from his home. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Nothing here but grains of sand, nothing much worth saving. Guess we've all got problems of our own to bear, and still we share. Tomorrow could get better than today. So he's mm -hmm. not being dreamy here. I think he's really yeah. acknowledging, look, we've all got things that are right in our face that are urgent, that need to be taken right. care of right now. We've all got bills to pay. We've all got to figure out where our next meal is coming from. Right. We have families things like that. So I don't think he's being unrealistic here, mm -hmm. but he also ends that particular couplet by saying, we still have this idea that no matter how bad things get, tomorrow still mm -hmm. has the potential to be right. better than today. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And then the last line that we'll look at, to the ones who've loved in vain, will you be beholden? And I think about mm -hmm. anybody whose heart has been broken either mm -hmm. in a romantic sense or a dream that got shattered or something they were working for mm -hmm. and they just right. fell short, things like that. Will they be resilient enough to get up off the canvas and try again? Was it Nelson Mandela who said, don't judge me by my successes, but judge me by the number of times I fell down and then rose again? Yeah, I know. Anything is a learning experience. Yeah. Either what to do or what not to do. Right. Well said. So the mm -hmm. song was originally on Sundown in 1974, of course. That was his ninth album, and it yeah. was on the Reprise label. 
Right. What is your favorite instrumental part of the song? And before you answer, we have acknowledged the fact that just to hear it stripped down to guitars and bass yeah. was yeah. probably very profound, but that's not the version that most people who are listening to this podcast right. and most right. people right. that are familiar right. with Gordon will have ever yeah. heard. So with the album version of it, what is your right. favorite musical aspect? I suppose it. The acoustic guitars, no yeah, doubt. Yeah, yeah. That usually makes it... I mean, it doesn't have a whole lot of production, but yeah, it's so effective without having the production. They would just maybe overwhelm the meaning of the song. I think there was probably just about the right amount of production. Yeah, yeah I think um, so, yeah. Because my favorite part of this is the orchestration, which oh, is yeah. done yeah. so well by Nick DeCaro. Yeah, it's very tasteful. It brings a cinematic effect to the whole thing. Yeah. It's a very 1970s yeah. thing to orchestrate songs that way. We didn't hear that much when we got into the 90s and beyond. I don't want to say it's a period piece because it is a timeless song, but that part of the musicality of it, the orchestration to me was yeah. far and away the best part. Mm -hmm. of it. We'll be right back to our conversation with Kevin and Aaron Hester about Too Late for Praying. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. The American West is a place of lore and legend, of triumphs and tragedies. No one can tell the true stories of the West better than author Rick Steber. And now there's a podcast showcasing his work. It's called Writing the West, and every episode will feature his short stories and his poetry. If you want to know the true stories of cowboys, pioneers, miners, and Native Americans, this 15-minute podcast is for you. Writing the West is available on Spotify, Audible, Podbean, or wherever you get your listening matter. That's Writing the West, the work of Rick Steber. Hello, I'm JT, a lifelong student of the paranormal and the unexplained. I've spent over 35 years researching and learning about a wide range of subjects, from UFOs and cryptids to ghosts and the supernatural, from hidden and lost treasures to mankind's mysterious past, and all other things mysterious and Fortean. Each week, I'll bring you some relevant and interesting articles in this genre, as well as a different topic, some you may be familiar with, but many you most likely will never have known existed. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride, and let me be your tour guide as we explore the unexplained on the paranormal sun. The people who played on this, mostly the usual lot, Lightfoot, Red Shea, Terry Clements, John Stockfish playing bass on this. He had left the band some time before then, yeah. so it was interesting that he was in on this one. And then, of course, Nick DeCaro. According to the two song... Guitar. Two guitars. Two guitars. Two guitars. Terry and Red. That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. According or are we? to some notes I have here, Terry played lead acoustic, Gordon played rhythm, and Red Shea played classical guitar. Well, that would make sense why they would do that. I, mean, I knew that Red had been credited with classical guitar yeah. um, right. on this, and that's very in keeping with his style. And then according to setlist.fm, he's only played yeah. this song once in concert. And we don't know that for certain, but according to the best sources I have, it was played in Red Rocks, Colorado in July yeah. of 1975, yeah. and that's it. If that is true, then it's kind of disappointing because although obviously you can't duplicate the orchestra, you could have gotten that stripped down version where it was just the guitars and the bass. And I would have mm -hmm. loved to have heard that. So I'm wondering, yeah. is there anything you can add to those numbers? Yes. I went to a place called sugarmegs.org, which they have a bunch of bootleg concerts on their site. And I went and looked at in the concert they had set list probably eight or 10 times in 74 and 75, at least. You'll have to tell me about that website when we get done here, because I'd like to do some research for future shows. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the song was not released as a single, but if I'm not mistaken, it was the B-side to the Sundown single, 
that was released in February of 74. And we know that that single went to number 33 in the UK, number one in the US, number four in Australia, and to number one in Canada. We also know that the album went to number one in Canada and the US and then number 13 in Australia. I don't have any figures for how the album did in the UK. Am I right in thinking that this was the B-side? Yes, you are. I, as a matter of fact, I have the single here. Okay, yeah. I, I will take your word for it. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. there's not a whole lot of great guides to, well, the B-side of this hit was ba boom so you really have to be more of a record collector like you are, Kevin, right. uh, right. to get mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It's been recorded, re-recorded rather, by at least two different artists. Barbara J, and she was on my show a while back talking about yeah. all the lovely ladies. Mm -hmm. And okay. Dieter Hufschmid, whom I had never heard of. Um, I haven't either. No. Okay. Are there any other cover versions that you know of? And if not, have you heard either of the ones I just mentioned? I have heard Barbara J's. There are quite a few covers, including some excellent ones, especially Brian Eckerd, who used to be a member of oh, he's quite really a few good. of the Facebook yeah. pages. That's on there. A few others from the Facebook pages have made very nice covers of it as well. Now, just so we're clear, are we talking about people sitting down and playing a video of it yeah. and uploading yeah, it? Yeah. Okay. Because I'm talking about quote unquote official commercial right commercial exactly. versions yes okay right. I mean, a lot right. of people can right. probably sit down and play it but just want to make right. sure we yeah. understood each other is there anybody who could do it commercially that you feel you would like to hear take a shot at this i'm really not that up on some of the current artists so i'm going to take it past on that one i can't think of anything either it was very hard for me to think of anybody that could do justice to this song. And mm -hmm. I couldn't think of any men who I thought could get away with it. Yeah. I did think of the Indigo Girls, and yeah. I'd love to hear a two-part harmony version of this. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. or Adele would be the other person that I'd like to hear yeah. do this. But in terms of guys, couldn't think of anybody that could really be true to the original spirit of the song. Right. I agree. I mean, who could do it better? No one well, could ever do it better. <laughs> but could somebody do something where they would do justice to the original spirit? Yeah. And no one right now that is around, I don't think, could do it. I would have liked to have heard Glenn Campbell do it, but God mm -hmm. clearly didn't happen. So as we're wrapping up here, this is the question I've been asking people for the last five or six months. Where were you and what were you doing when you found out that Gordon had passed away? We were in the house. We, yeah, we were we were at home. Well, on Facebook. And we were devastated. Yeah, we were. We thought maybe it was a hoax, like he always say on, t on stage, you know, um, my death has been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. He said that several times on stage. Mm -hmm. But this is not an exaggeration. This yeah. is the real thing. Yeah. But yeah, we were just devastated. So I can think of all the years that there was the hoax yeah. thing that Abe Vigoda had yeah. died, you know, yeah. and then him yeah. coming yeah. on David Letterman saying, I'm not Ooh. dead, you idiot. Yeah, right. He, <laughs> when he finally yeah. did pass away, then people yeah. had a good laugh yeah. over that. One other thing is, as you know from before, I had the great fortune of going back and meeting Gordon backstage on 10 occasions. Yes. Which was wonderful. And Aaron will, will read what he said one time. And this was from a Facebook post that we were discussing, Too Late for Praying. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. Too Late for Praying gets to me every time. I always have a tear in my eye after hearing it. It is one of the songs I would love to hear live. I asked Gordon about it after a concert. Gordon said, we don't do it in concert anymore because it's so deep and makes people think. We want them to relax and have a good time. His answer made a lot of sense. When you stop and think about it, what is the proper response to that? Would applause or a standing ovation work or would a moment of silence be more appropriate as you think about the message of the song? You know, I think it says a lot about his stage smarts that he decided to take that out because it really is, in some ways, it's a call to action, although it's not 
a specific, you know, okay, after you hear this song, you're going to get up and you give $20 to the Red Cross, or you're going to write a letter Mm -hmm. to Senator Windbag, or you're going to do something like that. But the only time that I think it would have worked in his set, and I wasn't there when it was done live, but would have been towards the end of the show to give people something to think about. The difference that I think of is that Harry Chapin always used his time in performing. He realized he had a captive audience. And so he was telling them all the things that he believed in, things that needed to be done, causes he supported. They were all good things, Mm -hmm. but he took advantage of that in a way that Gordon didn't. And Mm -hmm. it's not to say either approach is right or wrong. It's just to say that there is a different thing. And I understand his desire. Look, they paid money to relax and enjoy the music, not necessarily because they wanted to be told, okay, now go out and do something. Yes. Right. And although I think if you had given sodium pentothal to Gordon, I think he probably would have said, this is what I want you to go out and do because I feel very strongly about this. But that wasn't his job as a troubadour. And did you ever see the Rolling Stone review of the Sundown album? I did not. The album's last and most powerful cut, Too Late for Praying, is perhaps Lightfoot's finest creation, a modified hymn somewhat reminiscent of Paul Simon's American tune, Too Late, is both a prayer for our spiritual restoration and a lament for its absence. It is the work of a master craftsman whose endurance and prolificity have yet to receive just recognition in the United States. Was that Ben Fong Torres who wrote that or Jan Wenner? Or... Well, Stephen Holden. Okay, Stephen I'm not Holden. familiar with him, but I think the beauty of that song and the importance of that song kind of yeah. begins and ends with that statement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, Kevin and Aaron Hester, thank you so much for being on the show. I know it's cold in Iowa, but thank you for taking the time and love to have you back on the show again real soon. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Mike. We enjoyed it. And thanks for listening, everybody. If you like this well enough to listen to the whole thing, tell somebody about it. Carefree Highway Revisited is on Apple, Spotify, Acast, or wherever you get your listening matter. Our website is www.lightfootpodcast.com. I'd like to make a special request for you to visit my Patreon page. I love this show so much, and I want to keep it going. And you're in a position to help. Please head over to www.patreon.com slash carefreehighwayrevisited. A dollar or two a month is all I ask. You can reach me, Mike Messner, at teachermike72 at gmail.com. Well, our next episode will be focusing on the song Pussy Willow's Cattails from the Did She Mention My Name album. And my guest will be Jack Ward. He'll be coming to us from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Until then, for Kevin and Aaron Hester, this is Mike Messner reminding you, run for the roses, but don't forget to stop and smell them. We'll see you next time. 